A reading from Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 23. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in me, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, and you Philippians, Yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear friends, very good morning to all of you. How are you doing today? Let's come to the Lord in prayer as we commit this time before him. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you again, Lord, that you called us together here. And even as we come to listen to your word, we just want to ask, Lord, that you be with us this morning. And may your word impact our lives, not only intellectually, Lord, but in our hearts and by what we do. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. But dear friends, uh, today the message is entitled Contentment and Partnership in Ministry. And today we come to the very end of the book of Philippians. Uh, we are looking at that final portion. Remember, Philippians is an epistle of joy. And despite the fact that Paul was under house arrest, uh, he was chained to the Roman guard. Despite all these circumstances, we find that Paul exudes with joy. And so in your sermon outline, you will find the first point here. Why was Paul full of joy? And the reason is because Paul has put Christ above all in all things. Christ above all. Now, for those of you who have been to Methodist Youth Fellowship, you would know that that is the logo, Christ above all. Christ was indeed everything to Paul. Christ gave him meaning and fulfillment in his life. Remember in Acts chapter 9, Paul was persecuting the Christians. He was on the road to Damascus. And there he met the living Messiah, the one named Jesus. And Jesus talked to him face to face. Now it's interesting that from that time onwards, right until the time of writing this letter to the Philippians, and that's about 25 to 30 years, that Paul experienced the rich joy 
of knowing Christ deeper and obeying Christ's calling upon his life to be an apostle to the Gentiles. No wonder the book of Philippians is a Christocentric book, meaning that Christ is central in this book of Philippians. Paul describes in this book, and this is a little bit of a recap of what we have heard over the last few months. Paul describes Christ, what he has done in the past, his death and his resurrection. And that's evident in chapter 2. Paul also describes what Christ is doing in our lives now in the present and how Christ is there to help us in our journey of faith. But Paul also describes what Christ is going to do for us in the future. And he tells us that our citizenship is not on earth, but we are citizens of heaven. And one day the King of heaven will come back and he will come for us and he will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. And that is the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Now, it's well and good for Paul to say all these kind of things, but how about you and me? Have we applied this in our life? Is Christ really above all in all things? Now, just imagine I mentioned that from the time of conversion to, till now, it would probably have been about 25 or 30 years in Paul's life. And for some of us, um, we too have been Christians, maybe 25, 30, 40 years even. And the question I want to pose is, after all these decades, is Christ really the one that fills our life with joy, that we exude the joy of Jesus Christ, and it is infectious that other people also get excited when they see the love that we have for Jesus. When I was in Sunday school, I learned this chorus, and it will never leave my mind. Very simple chorus. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All his wonderful passion and purity. O thou spirit divine, all my nature refine. Till the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. And a simple Sunday school song, but it means so much. It tells us that the Holy Spirit is there to refine our lives so that we will be indeed more Christ-like. In the sermon outline, the next point today, we see how Paul's contentment that is being secure in Christ ties in with his partnership in ministry with the Philippians. Now, I wonder what picture conjures up in your mind when you hear the word contentment. I remember many years ago reading this newspaper article and it talks about a manager uh, in, a, in a firm, and this is a Western nation. And, and this was his idea of contentment. On a cold winter's night, he's at home. Uh, he's on a furry rug, uh, and there's a beautiful fireplace that is glowing and giving warmth to him. He has a hot beverage by his side together with some cookies. But best of all, he's reading a favourite book. And he has his pet Labrador next to him, lying beside him, and he is stroking his pet dog. And that is his definition of contentment. But it definitely is not Paul's definition, because Paul was chained to the Roman guard, and he was under house arrest. Now today we talk about the term lockdown, and, and I'm sure that, you know, we are frustrated, although recently the Prime Minister uh, allowed uh, inter-district travel. Paul's lockdown was different. He was chained to the Roman guard and he was under house arrest. The context of this letter, we see that God's worker recognises God's hand in allowing God's people to meet his needs. Let me repeat. God's worker recognises God's hand in allowing God's people to meet his needs. Now, the context of Philippians chapter 4 is that Paul is God's worker. 
He was called by Jesus to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He was church planter, evangelist, missionary, pastor, disciple maker. God's people were the Philippians in this context. Now remember Dr. David Paulson in his series, Unlocking the Bible. He was sharing with the audience and he asked the question, who among you are full-time ministry in the full-time ministry? And there was silence in the audience. And then he lifted his voice a little bit louder and said, who among you are in full-time ministry? Now the answer that he wanted is everyone in the audience because we are all saints. And in a general and broader sense, we are all called by God and we are all workers in God's vineyard. I remember as a young boy, I used to go to the Methodist church. And in those days, the pastor was in charge of the whole worship service. He was a liturgist, he was a worship leader, scripture reader. And the only other person on the stage was the organist. And I guess if the pastor could play the organ, he would have also been organist and the liturgist all in one go. But last week, remember, we talked about using our talents. And thanks be to God that in today's world, we have many people serving in the area of the Sunday worship service. Dear friends, in a narrower meaning uh, of the usage of the word full-time worker, are those called by God to devote their lives to God's work with no other workplace income. And let me emphasize with no other workplace income. Remember in the Old Testament days, uh, God had set aside one tribe, the Levites. And in Deuteronomy chapter 18, he said that the Levites will not receive land inheritance. And God says it's because God is their inheritance. And we know how God provided for their needs in the Old Testament days. In today's world, the equivalents would be like pastors, missionary, church planters, itinerant evangelists, etc. Now, I'm narrowing the uh, scope now to full-time workers, God's workers, uh, who actually um, have devoted their life to God's work and they don't have any side income. But let me uh, further split this into two categories. One category is those of God's workers who receive a regular income, guaranteed. And the other category is that those who do not receive a regular income. Now, all track pastors, Methodist pastors, local church workers, uh, we are those who receive a regular income, meaning that the church takes care of our needs. But for Paul, he was in the other category. He did not have a regular income. He relied on other people. In fact, in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 3, we find that Paul at Corinth, he was actually making tents. And that's a whole uh, uh, issue that I'll probably speak on another occasion. Let me give you an example of a church worker that, uh, that needs to collect funds. And in many mission agencies today, uh, we find that if you want to be a missionary, you enroll in the agency, but you have to raise your own mission financial support. And so we find that after doing theological studies, uh, potential uh, missionaries, they go from church to church, they write emails, and they will actually ask for funds. And missions agencies, they actually um, put a, a certain uh, ceiling that, that you need to, to get a certain amount of money before you can go into the overseas mission field. For example, 80%. And then when they are in the mission field, if their financial support drops to a certain level, say 65%, they actually have to come back to their home country and they have to raise more funds. And, and that's sad because God's work is being interrupted all on the issue of money or raising funds. Now, during pre-pandemic days, um, and, and this would not refer to KL Wesley, it would refer to my previous congregations. 
uh, whenever I uh, invited a guest speaker, they would ask me, uh, you know, what can I do? What can't I do during uh, the time in the church? And I know every uh, church, uh, they have a culture. And, and I, I must say, in all the churches that I served in, uh, money is a sensitive issue when it comes to the church board. Um, so I, I would advise them like this. I say, come preach God's word. Uh, do a good uh, PowerPoint presentation, maybe a slideshow, uh, photos of the mission field. And also, if you have a video clip from the missions agencies, do show it. But after service, a table will be assigned to you in the foyer. And then that's where you sit at the table with all your fundraising brochures. And people will come up to you and then you can explain to them how they can financially contribute. So they will take the brochures home and they will prayerfully consider and do the necessary in terms of financial contribution. But I also noticed that when I was sta standing there talking to church members, there are some people that were so moved by the Spirit of God. So they just came and they wanted to give a once-off cash donation, but they couldn't find an envelope. So you know what they did? They went and used a church pledge envelope and put the money in and gave it to the missionary. Now, these are scenes that warm my heart as a pastor. People who are touched by the Holy Spirit and, and responding in terms of supporting uh, missionaries. Let me give you another example. I studied in the Bible College of Victoria in Melbourne. And I had two good friends, husband and wife. They're Australians. They came interstate. They were from rural New South Wales. And they shared with me when they applied to Bible College, uh, they didn't really have the finances, but they applied in faith. A and they still didn't know where the money is going to come from. And then before they actually moved down to Melbourne, the community of farmers that uh, they were living with uh, called them and brought them to a huge trailer of wheat. A and they told them that we as the farmers of this community recognize God's calling upon you and this is our contribution towards you. And, and my Australian friends told me that when they, they sold the wheat, it could finance them for two years at Bible College. Everything covered. And that's when God touches the hearts of people. But the next item in the outline, there is a fine balance between God's worker showing self-sufficiency, meaning that I don't need your help and graciously allowing people to help God's work, worker. So on the one hand, we want to show self-sufficiency. On the other hand, we graciously accept contributions and support. And, and this will be more for that category who live by faith. Now remember uh, one of the leaders of my church, he, he was having a conversation with me. And he told me that if ever he becomes a pastor, he will never get a salary from the church. He will use whatever he has earned over all these years. And, and that's good. But sometimes, my dear friends, it will take 55 or 60 years before there is sufficient funds. And by that time, when a person wants to study in a theological school and serve the Lord, there may not be too many years left in that ministry. So on the one hand, God's worker does not openly or subtly solicit financial help. And, and, and this is important. Let me just repeat that. On the one hand, God's worker does not openly or subtly solicit financial help, lest two things could happen. Number one, he is seen as taking advantage of people. That, that's one scenario. And the second scenario is that he may be beholden or obligated to the donor who may, in fact, want to manipulate him or control God's worker. The first point, he may be seen taking advantage of people. And I'm very glad that as a young pastor, my first district superintendent, he actually shared with me plenty of examples of of pastors and workers who take advantage of God's people. Now, I can't mention some of this because uh, the details may be too private. 
But in those days, it was like theory. Today, after all these years of ministry, I can see it with my own eyes. What it means for a pastor or a worker to take advantage of people because of our status. You know, the title Reverend or Pastor is actually very powerful. And so God's worker must be very careful in this area. The adage that we can follow for those who are God's workers, use things, don't use people. Love people and don't love things. And indeed, this is so true in the area of ministry. Now, I share with you one of my colleagues, um, and, and he was a new pastor. It was his first church that he was pastoring. And, and a certain church member came up to him and said, Pastor, is there anything that you need, you know, in the parsonage, etc.? And he told him that, yeah, I'm, I, I need a washing machine. And, and that member actually bought a new washing machine for him. But after several months, that pastor realized there were strings attached, that that person wanted to control his life. So what he did was he took that washing machine and returned it back to the donor. And I think that was really very good of him to do that. Now, some examples in Scripture. Paul's final words to the elders of Ephesus, recorded in Acts chapter 20 at Miletus. And you know, this is after three years of ministry. In Acts chapter 20, verses 33 and 34, Paul says, in part of his longest speech, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and those who were with me. And you know, after three years of ministry at Ephesus, the people could see the integrity of Paul. Now, a lesson for God's workers and pastors is this, that when we go to a place, we need to be ourselves. That is important. But if our personalities need that honing, we, we need to come before God and ask God, God, you mold me and shape me to be more like Jesus. Secondly, we always need to be humble, and that is so very important. Number three, we need to love people. And you know, after Paul said that beautiful speech, the Bible records that they, they all knelt, they, they hugged Paul, they cried. And it's not because his words were so powerful. It was because he said that he will no longer see them. Now, my dear friends, this particular speech is a wonderful speech that all of us can read, meditate and take stock. But you know, the more important thing for them was that relationship. And same with God's workers. Building that relationship is so very important. We may preach the best sermons, but it doesn't mean very much if we do not invest in relationships. So on the one hand, the, the church worker does not want to solicit help, especially those of us who have a regular income. But on the other hand, we find that God provides good and trustworthy people to partner God's workers, to carry out God's mission. And this is called the grace of giving and receiving in Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. Now, Paul, in another epistle in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he has very good teaching about God's workers deserving wages. And he gives two pictures from the Old Testament. One is, do not muzzle the ox when it treads the grain. And secondly, those who serve in God's temple, that is the Levites, the priests, they are to be provided for in terms of lodging, in terms of food, in terms of their needs being met. Now, the one about ox and treading the grain, uh, it is not a lesson on agriculture. What, what the Bible is saying is that even as the ox uh, treads uh, the grain, uh, the ox is allowed to eat uh, that of the grain meaning that the worker deserves the wages. Now, in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, I wonder whether you know this passage. It's just a few verses that gives a bit of the glimpse of the women who followed Jesus and supported him in ministry. And the Bible tells us two particular women 
Their names are Joanna and Susanna. And it says that they are provided for the needs of Jesus and the 12 apostles. And, and, and Jesus graciously allowed them to meet the needs. Now, I've been in church long enough, and I'm not talking as a pastor. I'm talking from the time I was a kid. To know that there are people, including my parents, who are supporting uh, God's workers without any strings attached. And let me just give you a couple of examples. You know, in those days when I was a kid, uh, my parents were very excited when they had the opportunity of hosting a missionary. And sometimes it was just a meal, for example, lunch. And I know my mother used to go in the kitchen and cook her best lunch for the missionaries. And, 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 you know, as a little boy, I was very happy when missionaries come, you know, because mom is going to cook her best food and I'm also going to eat it. And I know for my dad, you know, after um, the lunch is over and the missionary is going off, my, my dad will take out an envelope and give it. And, and, and I know that there was money in that envelope, although he never mentioned the amount and we never asked him. My friend, some, some of these things, you, you don't have to know all the details. You can just see the attitude and, and you know that there are people supportive of missionaries and those who are God's workers. The highest and purest form of giving is anonymous giving. And, and during my duration as a pastor, there, there are times where people come with a large uh, uh, envelope with, with a lot of money inside and they say, Pastor, can you do me a favour? I want to give it to so-and-so who's God's worker, but I want it as an anonymous gift. So I'm just asking you to do me a favor. And you know, when I give it, usually they ask who is the person, and I said, no, this is an anonymous gift. And, and, and the donors actually tell me, I do not want the person receiving this gift to feel obligated towards me in any way. Paul understood the grace of giving and receiving. In chapter 4, verse 10, Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you revived your concern for me. And that word revived by uh, uh, Gundry, Robert Gundry, New Testament scholar, he, he says a more accurate word would be blossom. You know, for a long time, the uh, Christians at Corinth could not give any gift to Paul. But now when they, they sent Epaphroditus, uh, to visit him in Rome, they were able to give, and we, I believe it's a substantial financial gift. In verse 14, Yet it was kind of you to share in my trouble. Even as a very young church, the Philippians recognized missionary giving. And it's mentioned in verses 15 and 16. When I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. You know that term giving and receiving is a bookkeeping term that is familiar uh, in the world that Paul lived in. And, and Paul uses that term giving and receiving. These were new Christians, new church. And yet when Paul moved from Macedonia, where Philippi is, to the next place, Thessalonica, they gave financially towards him. Next point, God's worker understands that true contentment means being secure in Christ, regardless of circumstances. God's worker understands that true contentment means being secure in Christ, regardless of circumstances. There will be times of need in God's ministry where finances dry up. But you know, Paul had already made a commitment to Jesus Christ. And I believe it was right in Acts chapter 9, verses 23 to 25. And we find that Paul was so gung-ho for the Lord, you know, he was preaching and then the Jews wanted to kill him. So in Damascus, the Jews are waiting outside the city gate for an opportunity to kill him. But we find that uh, Paul's friends actually lowered him at night uh, through the city uh, walls 
in a basket down to safety. And, and I know without a shadow of a doubt that Paul knew that Jesus had protected him through the acts of his friends. No wonder Paul declares in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What a beautiful verse. And the context of this verse is about financial areas that the Lord will provide. In Philippians 4.12, Paul says, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and in need. And I would add, in chains of free. Now, remember uh, a good friend of my parents, uh, a young man, you know, full on fire for the Lord. He went to study in uh, Bible college. And, and when he came back, he shared with my parents, you know, there were times I did not have enough money. And so I had to eat bread and jam for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Just imagine bread and jam. He said he couldn't even afford to buy butter. And you know, my mother was very upset. She said, why didn't you write to us? We could have pulled some money here and, and sent for uh, your son. And, and he told my parents, I know that God is always there with me. Paul had already relied on Christ totally and now bountifully thanks the Philippians for their partnership in ministry. Let me just close with some practical application for today. We too can enter into holistic partnership through prayer, human resources, financial giving, and receiving reciprocal blessings. Firstly, prayer. Prayer is most important because it recognizes that God is there to answer our prayers. And the good thing about prayers is that you didn't have to be rich to, to pray. The poor people, the rich people, every type of people can pray. And we can engage in prayer at any time. Number two, human resources. We find that the church in Philippi sent Epaphroditus. And how does Paul describe him in Philippians 2.25? My brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, your messenger, your minister to me. Just imagine Paul, such a tough Christian. And yet when Epaphroditus came to him, he, he could experience a love and joy that was shared from the church at Philippi. Thirdly, financially, in uh, chapter 4, verse 18, Paul says that the gift given by the Philippians, he uses terms like a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable to God. And then he breaks forth into doxology. Firstly, he says, My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To God, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. What is contentment to you? Have you put Christ above all, in all things in your life? Is this the motto of your family? Mahatma Gandhi once said these words, We live simply so that others may simply live. And when I was growing up in, in, in my church as a small boy, uh, the church practiced this periodically, probably once in three months or so. It was an evening service. And after the evening service was over, the whole congregation was uh, invited to the fellowship hall. And there, a uh, simple porridge was prepared. No meat inside, uh, no flavorings, etc. Very bland, plain rice porridge. And, and we all were supposed to partake of this meal. And then there was a container. So whatever we saved on our dinner that night, we will put inside and even more if the Lord touched us. And this was one excellent way to teach the children that we can actually live on porridge. Yes, in church it may be once in three months, but we could practice this more frequently. And we can tell the children that 
that with this money that we will support those who are in need. Let us pray. Lord, we come before you today, Lord. Lord, we want to thank you for the Apostle Paul, even as he ends this beautiful letter of the Philippians. Lord, that he is so, so full of joy and he's thankful to you, Lord, for providing the Philippians to give financially for his cause. Lord, may we follow the example of Paul to be thankful, Lord, to express our thanks to others, to be grateful to you, Lord, for providing all these resources to us. Be with us, Lord, this day. In Jesus' name. Amen.